Okay, so officially, welcome, welcome, welcome. EDU 7100, we're, we're meeting again live, <laughs> brought to you by whomever. <laughs> so um, it's a small group, we're an intimate group, so we can go around the room and just sort of check in and see how folks are doing, what's happening. If you have any um, uh, good news to share, please do so. Uh, bad news, don't worry, worry about it. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so any questions, anything, you know? Um, so we'll start um, looking at my screen. Uh, Tori, you're up. Give us a, give us an update. What's happening with you? What's happening with life? Um, let's see, I don't have a huge amount to update on, just kind of balancing the work and the school thing. Um, it's been fun. I've spent a lot of time on the outline for this class this week. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like more like version to rough draft territory. So I'm feeling pretty good about that, but yeah. Okay. Ah. Thank you. I know uh, you're involved with the discussions and that's great. Uh, it's been good with uh, the feminist discussions and so forth. So we can get into that stuff today if you like. Also, um, I was wondering if uh, anybody wants to share um, their their research and, and what's happening with it and, and update us, uh, you know, with a reasonable amount of time, five to 10 minutes at the most. You can do that, please, yeah. Uh, Jessica, how are you and what's happening? I'm good. Um, I am just trying to learn to balance everything. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, just, uh, trying to do the extra reading in addition to the class assigned reading because there's so many things I want to read like I have a stack of books right here that I'm <laughs> that aren't class assigned readings but are readings that I want to do for this assignment that we have in this class as well as um, our other class for those that are in that one um, but just finding that time and actually being able to focus that's been difficult um, but I, I know that I'm not the only one experiencing that. It's just, I, li I like to read. I'm just a very slow reader, um, very slow reader. Uh, I, it took me a long time before I even enjoyed reading. It wasn't until later in high school. I think maybe there was a post one time I talked about that in actually. Um, so I do enjoy it. It just, depending on the concept or, you know, the style of writing, it takes me a little bit longer to focus mm -hmm. and then balancing that with, like Tori said, with full-time job and <laughs> having, you know, eating, going to the grocery store sometimes. Yeah. So, um, so I'm probably, I'm not as far along as I'd like to be that I was hoping to be, but I, I'm at least get, I'm starting to get there. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, you know, graduate school, academic life. Then there is life in general that happens too, whether we like it or not, it's happening. <laughs> uh, yeah, balance is always key. That's the word I use on a daily basis in different contexts. Because if you're in, intentionally looking for balance, uh, it can, the ways in which you can achieve balance will reveal themselves. Um, at least, you know, that's what the, the theory of flow is about, right? So anyways, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jessica. Uh, Priya, how are you? And what's going on with you in your life? Uh, thanks, Dr. Tony. All is good. I have to thank the, the universe for things being good in my life at this point when the whole world is... I feel there's a lot of the world burning. Uh -huh. That has drawn me down a bit. Um, um, my work has heated up, so that's a really good thing. Um, um, I've been a bit behind at school this week in terms of talking to the cohort. I have not looked at anyone else's writing on the on the feminism, you know, the stuff we were to read, we, we are to read. But I focused a lot more on the paper. Uh, the paper that is to be that we are to submit this week, and it has been um, a really it's like peeling of the onion, uh, a beautiful journey. You sowed the seed of putting centering everything 
on education. And that really opened up a completely new door for me. Uh I had one chapter in my dissertation in my head. It was about seeding a bio. call with a video. (laughs) Sorry. It, It was about seeding a biophilic city. And I thought that's the best point where I think about education, because how do you explain to others how even a regular citizen can help work towards a biophilic city? So I, I'm, I'm really loving that research, but it has taken me, I think this chapter, I had expected it to be like maybe 15, 20, 30 pages. I think it's going to go into 40, 45. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but I have figured that education also is about unlearning. Mm. Unlearning, uh, because I'm seeing, I don't, I don't hope nobody will take offense to this, but I feel whiteness is there in every one of us. Um, And it's so deep. It's like you wonder how things like patriarchy, sexism, whiteness are just part of the way we work in society. And I'm seeing that so much. So I put part of my this whole chapter on unlearning and then learning with your own body, with your own mind. You know, I was thinking of my meditation. When we breathe, we are so much in the present moment. And that heightens awareness. And that talks about, particularly my breath is my survival. So it helped me relate to animals and their survival. And I kind of connected all of that to make that a piece of the education. And I was thinking sitting in these towers and libraries and glass windows there is really no vocational education. Uh-huh. So we need, we need a lot of handwork to be able to, and we need to connect with communities that are in dire situations. So it's, it's, been, it's been good. Um, on, the, uh, on the personal side, of course, I was drawn down with the whole Ukraine thing because I'm seeing a lot of mess there and a lot of whiteness and a lot of, uh, crazy, crazy stuff going on. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking a little longer, <laughs> but I, I also have a friend who's going through a lot. She's so much younger than me, but she's going through a health issue for the past 11 years. And the child really wants to study. And mm-hmm. here I am having the privilege of education at this age mm-hmm. and a beautiful cohort and wonderful professors ready and open, you know, to accept my thoughts too. And I was just thinking of the, the asymmetry and, this, and the fact that I have so much privilege and she wants to study. She put in her application, but again, a health issue came up. Uh-huh. So uh, I think we have to study with everyone's suffering in mind uh-huh. so that what they can't do, maybe we have to do it for them as, uh-huh. as well. So all of these thoughts are kind of in my head. It's chaotic, my mind, but but good. And I appreciate all the reading and the viewing. It's it's tremendous. Thank you. Glad to hear that. I mean, you bring up something that sometimes in in the midst of uh, chaos of life and and, uh, the busyness of uh, particularly in the western part of the hemisphere, we forget that. a big part of the human condition is suffering. Um, I haven't met a single person in my life that does not suffer in, in one context or the other. And uh, you can always be cognizant of the, the suffering. And then the levels of suffering, of course, are different. Uh, what we suffer from here is far different than what the people in Yemen suffered and now the ukrainians uh, are, are feeling that sort of pain that the yemenis and the ethiopians and the, <laughs> the iraqis and the afghanis have been feeling for decades um it's it, it can be overwhelming at times if we uh get sucked into it it's like a vortex you know it can just bring you down uh 
So again, <laughs> recognizing the suffering being a big part of the human condition and then looking for balance. Um, yeah, Dr. Kashani, I thought about suffering uh -huh. and I separated it from trauma. When we suffer, it's, it's suffering. It's, you can't compare pain. Pain is pain, real for everybody. Mm -hmm. But generations of trauma, like the Afghanis, like the Palestinians, like I think that is way deeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we have to recognize that when we speak or talk about, you know, at least distinguishing between suffering and trauma. Um, right. So, A very good point, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe after we go uh, with the check-ins, we can uh, pick up on this and, and, and talk about a little bit and make the connection to what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening around the world, and 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 uh, the, the subtlety of uh, you know generational uh, transfer of, of, of suffering and pain and, and all that. Uh, thank you so much, Priya, uh, Lindsay. Um, konnichiwa. Ohayou gozaimasu. Ohayou gozaimasu. Yeah, how are we doing? <laughs> uh, I'm awake. <laughs> yeah, as a continuation, I guess, about the, the war. I watched um, the thin red line and um, the... Um, Darius Malik's brilliant. Yeah, and uh, I... Uh, uh, wrote in my my comments about that, but I forgot to add in about the reading that you'd add about Palestine as well. So I kind of wanted to bring that in. And uh, just yesterday we managed to watch the Queen of uh, Catway. So we'll. Uh, I wanted to kind of rewrite some of my comments after after um, watching that yesterday, finding the time to do that. So very cool. Yeah. 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 I'm. I'm really. I'm really pleased to have to to watch I'd, I'd seen Brokeback Mountain before and um like that's that's you know quite recent uh when it first came out I mean it's in the 2000s so right? it's this past 20 years <laughs> so it's starting to feel old but yeah the, it was quite recent so it was nice to watch that again and and um the 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 other the do the right thing I remember that when it first came out so it was good to to revisit that as well um but yeah finding time like Jessica said like I mean that's that's a huge chunk of time to watch those movies right and um doing all the reading and the extra reading like yeah you know we just want those inputs right just yeah. <laughs> I wish I could just all oh, that title book I really want to read it but yeah trying to learn to skim read a little bit you know read the the topic sentence and then see if the paragraph's worth reading or um you know read I don't know whether it's good or bad but to to read the introduction and the conclusion and then decide if I should read it or not right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah just just trying to do those things um like everyone else focusing on the midterm was more important than you know um writing the comments this week and I've I've pulled something together it is not the paper I wanted to write um I I tried to pull my original ideas and started going off on too many tangents and and uh doing reading and then catching myself and like oh this is not anything to do with the the original idea that i had i have to stop and i i contacted a friend and and tori helped me out a little bit too but i i was like i can't i can't keep doing this and she's like stop it stop stop <laughs> going off on a tangent you've got to focus you can only read what you have to read and leave that other stuff until later so I was like okay okay so I've written I've written this paper and it's it's just a small piece of what I want to write about <laughs> and it's just uh yeah um I I'm so happy that Priya mentioned thinking about the dissertation again because uh, I guess that's what we have to do. It's just a building block. It is uh -huh. not my life work. It's not my my end 
you know, <laughs> 50, <laughs> 300 page <laughs> life work, right? right magnum an assignment, <laughs> just got to get it done, right? Follow the structure and do it. So um, that's where I'm at with that right now. So, okay. um, yeah, there's all, everything's coming together. But yeah, like like Priya too, I'm so happy to, to be part of this group and um, have the ability to feel heard i think uh, that's really great so uh, thank you <laughs> yeah and i appreciate every word that I'm hearing <laughs> today from everyone wouldn't it be great if you if this is the only thing you had to do you yes just, you know then immerse yourself in the books and all that the, the privilege that some of these academics have you know the ones the, the, the elite you know where they just get sabbaticals and time off and grants and then they come out and it's so much of the work is so flat mm -hmm. and I see you know I see them in conferences and on television and, and read their stuff I'm like man if I had your time the kind of stuff that you know we could do uh, but and again it's all part of the human condition maybe you know we do better work if we're kind of like trying to balance it all right it, it's hard to tell it's hard to tell and it's an excellent point you make Lindsay uh, about dissertation or any of these papers it's got to get done that's the number one objective and you cannot expect it to be your magnum opus your your brilliant you know life-changing event for everyone around the world and uh, the intention has got to be that right uh, and then when you get your license which is that EDD degree, then lots of things will open up and then you'll have opportunities where you can do some of that, you know, uh, then, then you just go back and go, wow, I did this and I can use this. Wow. I, I, it's, it's amazing how we reflect upon our uh, abilities and the work we produced in the past or, you know, in the present, we think, ah, it was blah, but you go back and you go, wow, I am capable. And recognizing our own capabilities uh, is something that uh, that sometimes gets lost in, in in fear and you know imposter syndrome kicking in and and you know uh, feeling you know kind of overwhelmed and 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 sometimes traumatized by events and, and things and, and all the rest of it. Again, I think the the key word here, like a comedian that keeps using the same <laughs> punchline coming back, balance, balance. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Angela, hey. please share with us what's happening with you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm doing well. My family, well. my stepchildren are well. Um, work is good. But like Priya, watching the world. And um, I think trying to balance it's something I've been thinking about in my paper, like what is the connection between idealism and Mm -hmm. maybe realism and like getting something accomplished whatever that means and how does that connect to working with students every day because they mm -hmm. need hope if I come in every day and you know point to every big challenge the world is facing with no path for them to try to process it absorb it take some action experience the mm -hmm. other great things about being alive um, I think it's too much for middle school students <laughs> right. so I've been thinking about that like my own frame of mind and what I'm bringing into that space and and then thinking about Dewey and Freire that's what I'm researching um uh -huh. two thinkers and how they connect and how their work it seems interesting articles that I read that compare and contrast them it seems like they want to pit them against each other sometimes the authors yeah, like they have yeah. to choose one that they like better but I wonder if maybe they could be complementary or build on each other in some way. And so mm -hmm. that's what I've been thinking. Mm -hmm. about. Yeah, and, and you are doing a wonderful job of uh, that investigation because it's revealing the connections and, and, and the parallels. That's the thing about um, philosophy of anything, right? In this case, philosophy of education, that you have people in different parts of the world, basically with, same intentions and, and same kind of you know deliberations and they're coming up with theories that are original 
And then when you compare them and put them next to each other, and go, wow, this person was thinking the same way as the other person. And then, um, th then you discover the nuances. And that's where the, the work you know, lies, the, the nuances and doing deliberations on the nuances. And uh, then you can see differences and similarities. And, and um, the compare contrast work is, is a big part of scholarship, of course, right? And that's what we do, anticipating um, the opposition to anything, <laughs> et cetera. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you. And, and it, it's really important work you know, that everybody's doing. Yeah. Uh, Bailey, uh, last, but of course not least at all, <laughs> share with Thanks. us. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, first, I apologize for not having been muted earlier. I did not realize at this point in Zoom world, I should have known, but um, my life is good. You know, we're very fortunate that life is good. I find um, on weeks when we have more watching to do than reading, I do struggle because I think I can multitask with like parenting and stuff with reading. But if I have to like focus on watching something, independently of my children that's a lot harder for me to do I'm taking the tv for two hours is like I don't know not ever a thing so like I have to <laughs> make time make time for that it's harder for me on the watching weeks than on the reading weeks but um I have I've seen Brokeback Mountain when it first came out in early 2000s and I've I've actually shown my students do the right thing um uh -huh. before so I have a an understanding of like how to talk about those. Um, it's interesting, my mom is a fifth grade teacher and she just showed her students Queen of Katwe um, and then like taught them how to play chess as like a lesson that they did in their classroom on a one, like a Friday or something like that. So I'm interested to see that one um, just because like in terms of talking about how to use them in the classroom, um, you know, seeing it in real life and then like the theory versus reality component that Angela was just talking about um, is always a really interesting comparative piece. So um, yeah, I'm good, it's good. My research is interesting. Like I think that that's the piece about this that I love so much is that the research is stuff that I'm so into, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And it sucks that there's not always enough time to do that part, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like with all the other pieces that you're trying to get through, but like, I'm really fascinated by my research and I'm really invested in, in it. So um, that's the exciting part of all of it. There's making time for that too. So uh -huh. um, yeah, it's going well overall. I feel good. I unfortunately can't stay on this for super long because I have to go bring my dog somewhere because he is not doing well, um, uh -huh. which is unfortunate for me. <laughs> but um, So I will be hopping off probably in about 15 or 20 minutes or so. Oh. Well, we are recording, so you know. <laughs> I know I'm very happy we're recording more, this one. More viewing for you to do, <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, we can uh, from this point forward, uh, we can choose uh, what we want to talk about as a group. If you want to share with the class, um, you know, in a five ten minute uh, portion of the time. Uh, about your research, that's an option. If you don't want to, that's another option. Uh, we can talk about, there's so much to talk about, right? We can talk about the readings that, that we have had this past few weeks. We can talk about what we're doing this week and the, and the following week. Um, uh, and, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we can talk about. We can talk about theory, we can talk about techniques, we can talk about uh, psychology of, uh, scholarly work. We can talk about philosophy of education in, in one area or the other. Um, I'm open to any topic that you choose to focus on as a group. Um, because I've been so focused in the, uh, the midterm and the, and the readings this week I don't actually know what's coming next week so maybe that might be a good place to start in what what we've got to uh, the step we've got to take next week so okay. uh, what what are the themes of next week okay uh perhaps I should share screen yeah okay so let me pause the recording for right now so I can just because it'll take a minute or two for the share screen
Um, okay, so uh, we're doing the, the cinema part. Uh, next week, you know, we'll continue. Uh, then, you know, there'll be some posts and, and I'll get involved as well. And then after that, you got two weeks of just sort of self-study. Um, we'll get together. I'll send, you know, emails to, to folks uh, or um, messages on the feedback about your midterm as, as things come in. Uh, and then we get together within those two weeks and then we can talk about your paper, uh, you know, touch on some things uh, we need to. And, and then after that, after the self-study week, the education, art and freedom, uh, that is, as Lindsay pointed out correctly, is kind of like coming back to what we started the course with. So uh, the work is, is in some ways a review and then kind of like solidifying uh, which way we're headed, you know, there'll be some discussions, agreement, disagreements, uh, building upon, you know, each other's uh, discourses uh, that we're having with, you know, two, three people together and so forth. Um, and then, then we're done, basically. And believe it or not, it's the finish line is closer than, than one might imagine. Uh, Lindsay, you have your hand up, please. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to ask the this midterm. Uh -huh. uh, I know that we've all been putting um, all trying to limit our ideas to fit it into into the midterm. The the end of term um, assignment. Do we just expand on what we've already written, or we should be writing a whole new? Uh, new thing or we should take one like one paragraph and and expand that out or it's free to uh, to do whatever yeah. should it be more structured that we're just adding no, let me just rather than my, changing yeah yeah it's, it's a good question question always comes up right what, what do i do with all this stuff well you know if you notice the work is progressive right so you're building scaffolds around what you're putting together uh, so you're building the house and right now you should be at the point where you're starting to think about the well, wiring is done uh, the board is up everything's up foundation is done and all that so i gotta start painting i gotta start you know putting the light fixture in and, and uh, pay attention to my roof and see if it's completed and all that uh so yes you build on what you've done you, so you don't go back and just start the paper from uh excuse me one second. My apology, I forgot to put my phone on silent <laughs> mode. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, don't try to like go back and just you know put the notes and, and then start writing with the first sentence. Use everything you've got and then throw it all in, including the kitchen sink, and then spend those two weeks, the, the process, start the process of editing. And, and then when we meet, you, know, we, you can share uh, you know, where you're at, and then uh, you know, we can look at what you're doing together, and then uh, you should be on your way towards the finish line uh, then. Now, just to set your mind at ease, um, there is a, obviously there is a, a due date, you know, of uh, April 17 for you. But, you know, if you're a few days here and there, don't, don't worry about it. You can, so it's not like set in stone, uh, but don't, in the back of your mind, don't use that as something to, so you procrastinate and then you end up being overwhelmed with it. Um, so what I'm saying is I'm flexible with that date. Uh, and I want you to stress over this. Uh, and at the same time, I want you to be satisfied with what you're submitting, right? Uh, and if you run into any issues, uh, get in touch with me early and not after the due date, you know? Uh, and then we can work stuff out, yeah. Does that seem fair? I, I, you know, fairness is important to me. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Benevolent dictators are always fair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so are we done with the, the sharing? Is anybody, okay. Thank you, Tori.
appreciate that. Yeah. Um, okay. So what, do you want to talk about cinema? You want to talk about feminism? You want to talk about Ukraine? You want to talk about, what, what would you like to talk about? What's on your mind? Dr. Kashani, I have yes, a Priya, yes, small please. request. I just realized I'm quite behind, I think by about a, at least a week, if not more. When uh, Lindsay was mentioning Brokeback Mountain, I couldn't even relate to what she was saying. So I think I'm about two weeks behind in terms of the, re I'm, I've stopped at the freedom and mm -hmm. then I got to my paper. Uh, may I request you to keep the, uh, the chats open so I can go back and read other people's work and re respond? I would like to do that. Yeah, I think it's open. You don't have to, things don't close automatically. So you can always yeah. go back. Even right. with freedom? Uh, they're all still open. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. There's the still thing, questions I want to answer in, in step yeah. two. But I thought the they closed is, after the deadline because I couldn't enter. Really? Yeah. The previous I'll check that out. I'll check that out. Thank yeah. you. But you know, the thing is, uh, Priya, if you fall behind on the discussion forum, the best strategy is always to just sort of skip what you missed and then uh, bring yourself up to the current discussion. Because particularly with the, the, the cinema stuff, you know, we live in a visual culture. This is an important uh, part of the discourse. Um, you know, you can go back and, and pick up on stuff at any point. But if you try to catch up uh, with the old stuff and then bring yourself to the current point, um, that could be very stressful. And, and um, it may not you know, bear the kind of fruits that you're expecting. So just as a recommendation, saying forget about that, just move forward, stick with what we have now. Um, sure. So thank you. Sure. I was, I was grateful to have a break and, and be able to, ha I know Bailey, you, you said, you know, you, it's difficult to, to have kids and watch at the same time, but I find it difficult to read when my kids are around. Um, I find it easier to, to watch, you know, I feel as though I can multitask, even though I've been researching that we, nobody can multitask, but, um, you know, I do feel as though I can multitask a little bit more with the, the visuals and the, uh, yeah. Uh, watching. You could be chopping vegetables while you're watching the film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> notes and then having a little notepad. I do it all the time. <laughs> uh, Trade secrets. <laughs> yeah. Just don't chop, you know, onions while you're watching. <laughs> um, I have a, a question about yes. how to approach, I guess, reading. Maybe reading a film isn't the right phrase. No, that's uh, fine. you say that, yeah critiquing or yeah. analyzing a film yeah. and there was a part in I don't know when we encounter movies where it talks about continuity editing yeah and I was wondering if we could talk about like a film that's the differences between a film that is edited for continuity versus one mm -hmm. that's not I don't know if I could objectively yeah. identify the difference yeah i can give you a micro lecture on that <laughs> yeah um, just a short version <laughs> but then, i don't know and then like so the films we watched were those examples of films that did not have continuity editing? no actually uh i think all of those films have continuity editing yeah okay what continuity editing is is um weaving a narrative, like, you know, putting together like a five-year story into two hours, right? Yeah. So uh, a simple example to just sort of you can visualize what continuity editing is. And this was introduced to the world of cinema um, back in uh, early 1900s. Um, D.W. Griffith's film, which was a racist film about you know, glorifying the Ku Klux Klan, um, Birth of a Nation, uh, gave the world of cinema the possibility of continuity. So technically, it's a watershed moment. Um, so what continuity editing is, is uh, think of this example. You, you're watching a film. The character wants to go and, and, and give a speech somewhere, right? First, you see a, a long shot of a campus. Right? OK, so your mind finds the location. 
Then the character exits the car. You see the character. Next thing you see is the character standing at a podium speaking. So the whole process of him walking to the stairs and you know saying hello to somebody, getting coffee and all that, it's just eliminated. Yet your mind weaves it all together. We make the assumptions that this is what happened. And so it's absolutely natural for us to see him at the podium next. Those little um, connections are part of continuity editing because the master shot may have been that, you know, he came in and then they followed him and all that. And the director and the editor sit together and they make the decision, okay, let's cut all of this. Let's just send them straight to the podium. All right. That's the continuity editing um, concept. Uh, some people do it really well. Hollywood is, is uh, expert at continuity editing. And, and so they, the mantra is that if you don't notice the editing, then we have succeeded in continuity editing. All right. Uh, so now there are filmmakers. This was particularly strong with uh, new wave filmmakers of the, the French filmmakers of the era of 50s and 60s. Uh, these were intellectuals who were essayists and writers and philosophers who decided to make films like uh, Godard. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard, and they went against the Hollywood approach of continuity editing. So they would have jump cuts, they would have uh, distortions, and all of a sudden, you know, the point, the idea was, let's make the audience notice that we're making a film. So bring the audience into the, the discourse that this film is, turn it into a dialogue between the audience and, uh, and the, uh, the story as opposed to American cinema's approach to just, you know, putting together a, a whole story where you can suspend your disbelief and just be involved in this reality, a make-believe reality and all that. They're both legitimate forms of filmmaking and, and cinema. Um, now, to our taste in, in the US, because this process of, you know, this continuous stories is cultivated for us, the jump cuts and all that, and the, the opposition to continuity editing feels weird, right? I get this from students all the time. I'm like, what is this? They didn't know how to make films? <laughs> you know, like as if cinema is only uh, Hollywood cinema, right? That's the unfortunate thing. It's kind of like the Eurocentric approach to everything, act, academy, sciences, and all of that. Whereas like the standard has to be this, Hollywood, right? Um, so does that answer your question or was there something else that, that we need to discuss in, in that reference? Uh, to well, I think it answers my question, but then, so how does that shape the messaging of mm -hmm. the film? So maybe it leaves pieces out or pieces that are open to interpretation that right. maybe you would interpret it a certain way based on. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add to this right. a okay. little? Please, yes, please. So I know you were saying, oh, none of these films had that but i felt differently about the queen of Ket 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 what is it Ketwa? yeah Ketwa. okay i want to make sure so i remember and i even wrote about this in my post there was okay. a couple scenes where it cut weird or i didn't understand the purpose of the scene at all and i would turn to my husband and be like did that <laughs> did that make sense to you or or why did they why did they even add that? And it would be like a little scene that, that didn't really contribute to the story, or it would be like they cut it off and all of a sudden you were in a whole different scene. And when it comes to messaging, I felt like that was distracting for me as, yeah. as much as like this film I was able to because I was watching it from a perspective to find a message. But as, as somebody like my husband who's just viewing it, he, you know, I think it like takes away from the messaging that you're trying to get um, because you're distracted. You're like, well, wait. And so you're still thinking about that scene that happened of what was even the purpose of that. And there was a couple times in that movie and I was surprised because it's not it, it's not uh, even that old of a movie either. I had not heard of it, which is surprising because I love Disney and I yeah. didn't realize it was a Disney movie. Um, okay. And I've seen like almost all the, maybe not recently, but, uh, but I was, I was just surprised a couple of times. And then it was funny because I, I read about 
what you're you're talking about afterwards and I was like oh, that's exactly what I experienced and it, it literally took away from me being focused and just being within the movie and staying within it and it was there was a couple times it was frustrating and I felt even like the movie could have been shorter because there were scenes that really did not make any sense to me at all their conversations didn't con tribute and it would be like they were really short scenes when it would happen uh -huh. and I can't I can't even think of one I feel like there was one time they were in a pool and it was like for five seconds it wasn't even a long scene and they were just it, it was just kids hanging in the pool and it didn't make any sense to the message of the movie uh -huh. other than like oh that's cool they get to play in a pool which they normally wouldn't do at home and thinking like that but beyond that it wasn't it, it took away a lot for me. Yeah. I, yes, I can, I can respond to your observations uh, as, as follows. Uh, the film is made by Mira Nair, who is, uh, you know, her background, academic background is in sociology, you know, Harvard graduate and all the rest of it. Uh, she started making films uh, long ago and, and made some brilliant films. Mississippi Masala, which I've written about extensively and namesake and these are two films her idea uh, of uh, she's an uh, in some ways an auteur filmmaker uh where she brings the other into the the story and the other becomes the protagonist of the story and so on one thing we have to remember is that cinema like other art forms similar to it but cinema uh, at its uh at the top of the list of intentional media. Cinema is an intentional medium. So everything that happens that you see on the screen, particularly with films that have a good budget, like Queen of Kafka had a decent budget, Disney, you know, providing funding and so forth. Um, she intended that to be there. Now, sometimes the intention is to break with continuity for a short period kind of like, you know, Godardian approach, um, can have mixed results. Some people love it. They're like, oh, good. I was jolted out of my suspension of disbelief. Now I can see we're making a film about a real character, about the real life, and yet, yet this is all dramatization of uh, what goes on with life. And I can't reflect upon this saying, I mean, like, you know, in reality, you get together with family and friends and so on. That's real. But if you record that and, and see it on screen, is it still the same reality? Well, the answer is no. It's recorded reality. It's a new form of reality. You're going to see things that you, you didn't see while you were at the get together. Um, so that's the intention. And, and sometimes it fails. And in this case, it sounds like you know it might have failed because you were so uh, involved with uh, the Queen of Kafka, you know. Uh, the the overcoming of, of obstacles being the uh, you know the resisting of the the pressure to give up right and, and uh, in some ways you could say hey it's a it's a reflection upon the American dream right uh, persevere never give up and then success will come you will find your way etc um, but yes it's a good point you bring up you know. Not all of it is the smooth, you know, uh, web that <laughs> that we see from beginning to end. Now, for me, because um, this is my field, uh, I see, I accept it all. You know, I embrace it all. You know, even like an independent film. You see a lot of these independent films that you know you could tell that you know if they had a little more money, if they had another person with more. Uh, you know, another professional that could do this or that, or the sound quality is down, all that. But it could have been different. But then at the same time, we're like, well, this is what they have. And this is, let me see what they've got. Uh, and not dismissing it, and all that. Uh, so these are good observations. Now, talking about cinema, um, to what extent do you think, and this is my curiosity-based question from you, because you are thinking, folks, you are, um, you go beyond the second order, you're at the, the higher part of the second order thinking, you, you're, uh, you're analyzing, you're, you're critically uh, 
examining what you see and what you feel and all that. Um, do you think that cinema can be a transformative uh, vehicle for humanity? Now, on individual basis, as well as uh, collective, like, you know, um, social scale. Hi, Carolina, welcome. Hi, good morning. My apologies. I thought it was at noon. <laughs> oh, it's nice to have you with us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and see you all in real life. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll catch up with you once, uh, you know. Yeah, no worries. Please continue. Yeah, no worries. So what do you think? Have you ever seen a film uh, that afterwards you were just either really disturbed and you're thinking, oh, this is like doing something to me. I'm, I'm a little angry. I'm a little this or that, but you know, I'm thinking about it. And then days go by and then you're still thinking about it. And then you feel like I'm a different person as a result of experiencing this film. Kind of like what happens with books, right? Of course, a book is a longer journey as you read in the book, right? A film you see in two hours, one sitting, and maybe you go back to it like a month later or two weeks later. Uh, with the book, you know, you're, you're going along with the journey for a long time. Um, but cinema is audiovisual. It uh, has the mystique that the book doesn't have. So can you think of uh, any experience you, you had that it might be like what I'm describing or not? You could say no. <laughs> Um, there's the French, the French film. Um, it's by the same director that did Amelie. Do you uh, know the Amelie yeah, yeah. film? Um, and the one before, and I can't for the life of me think of the um, the title of the film. But in within that film, there's there's a, a black and white scene with pigs, and um, I don't know. It was just so bizarre, and it was so random. Like it, the the director has a, it, it, it was just sort of flashes of images, almost like the Clockwork Orange, where you're sort of glued and they're just like pumping these things in your eyes. And uh, it was yeah. Even now, like I still I still remember the scene that that um, so That's random. Stanley Kubrick's uh, <laughs> right the masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah, the clockwork orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's disturbing too. <laughs> what about the pigs? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I well, it, it was just that they were so random and in black and white, and um, yeah, that was the image that just flashed in my mind when you yeah. were discussing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So what about the films that uh, you've seen, The Thin Red Line? Um, so I put in my comments as well, that I, uh, my daughter was in the room, right, while I was watching that film. And I didn't, I, you know, um, whether that you, they'll have lifelong effects, because, you know, she she's uh, she's five and she was just playing, but, she, you know, she was watching little bits and pieces and, you know, she'd catch some of the bloody scenes and things. And it's just like, well... I, I like I I guess I'm quite liberal in the fact that I don't really pay attention to uh, parental guidance things on the you know whether they're 18 or 15 or or um, and allowing her to be present as I'm watching it and making me think about the current situation in the Ukraine you know people are actually living through seeing these deaths for her it's just very abstract it's just on the screen so she can detach herself from that and how fortunate we are in our situation that we can just be detached from that and it is just something on the screen uh -huh. but um but also like you say the the um how is that going to stay with her because i still remember watching the american werewolf when the head goes across the the um the car the the american werewolf attacks somebody and the head comes off and it rolls down the car and that cinematic thing at that point of having 
a head rolling on a car was was amazing right i mean no one had been able to 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 have all that gore at that time like it was uh uh yeah, whether whether that that stays with her, that yeah. that scene, you know. Um, it may, it may. Uh, yeah, but it, I mean, it's good. It's good because you know it, we're in a war. The war is happening all the time, and you know it's something that we should be able to relate to. Yeah. And like you say, this transformative thing, right? Where it it, it is, and I, I, you know, it it can transform as an individual but also i think you know if we are all viewing similar things at similar times across the world then why why cannot it, it something help society deal with something or progress through something as much as it's that's why they win awards right that's why films mm -hmm. get this prestige to get the message further out yeah i don't know is that right <laughs> do you think so <laughs> Uh, well, just a little background uh, about the film. Then I want to, you know, hear your your reflections about, you know, those of you who've seen it. Uh, Terrence Malick uh, is an auteur filmmaker. Um, auteur filmmakers, you know, have they have an obsession about certain themes. They keep coming back to their films, and uh, you could always make the argument that they're making the same film in different contexts <laughs> over and over. Um, so he his background is philosophy and uh, moral philosophy of that. And, and his uh, cinema, the type of cinema he produces, heavily influenced by a Russian filmmaker um, who died a long time ago by the name of uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. So if you see some Tarkovsky films, and most Americans are not familiar with Tarkovsky unless they've gone to film school, All right? This is the, one of the saddest things about uh, our perceptions of Russia right, um, in this country, because for so long they've been vilified that we, we sort of like are not exposed to uh, the rich literature and the history of literature, legacy of literature, uh, cinema, um, uh, you know, ballet and symphony and, and, and all these things, the, the cultural heritage of Russia is so important, such contributions to the world uh, that are important. Anyways, so Tarkovsky is influenced Malik uh, in terms of the visual approach and uh, philosophical thinking. Uh, so the, the film does not have uh, the, the kind of like plot driven, right, you know, um, beginning, middle, end, uh, first act, second act, third act approach that uh, standard narrative films have. Uh, it is a narrative, but it's a narrative like our discussion. We talk about different things, and then we, we try to look for different dimensions to the human condition. And the film is, is, uh, is asking about, it's a, it's a series of questions, like any philosophical deliberation, series of questions about the human condition. Why do we do this? And why do people become pawns to, and the innocent people who have nothing to do with, you know, uh, the greed and the, 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 the hunger for power and all these things that, that cause wars uh, become the ones who are the most um, heavily you know, punished, the, the, the biggest victims of all of this. Uh, sorry, Carolina, I, I, you wanted to speak and I, I caught you up. No, no worries, no worries. This is, no, I was thinking, and I'm glad that you spoke because then I'm thinking of other things, but what I wanted to say, uh, Lindsay, when you talked about your daughter watching or being in the space, right? And we're kind of similar with our kid. We, I mean, we, she wants to watch. Oh, she asked us what our favorite movie was. And she said, can I watch it? I'm like, not quite yet. Um, it's Pan's Labyrinth. And I wanted to talk about that movie because speaking of, you know, like talking about a historical event from so many different perspectives, like how does the child live under abuse by the same person who is attacking um, mm. the people in their country, right? Um, and then all the magical side that he brings in and the, the symbolism and all the, the magical characters, right? Um, and for that, for many reasons, it's one of my favorite, I almost named my daughter after the character of the girl 
but my 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 sister vetoed so i couldn't because she said it's an old lady's name in colombia don't name her ophelia um so but then it made me think of you know the the importance of movies to send a message but also the danger of movies to maintain certain narratives right especially when it comes to war movies because it 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 maintains the narrative of the good guys and the bad guys, and it gives the viewers a certain idea of um, who's the villain and what do they look like and what should we fear from them, right? And that, and I've been struggling a lot with what's happening right now. And obviously I'm so empathetic with what's happening in Ukraine and with the you know millions of people who are having to leave their country, but this is not new right this is uh, there's been refugees and ex ex for years and they have and in europe they have not if you're brown they've not been treated the same way that ukrainian refugees have been treated and so even the media and the movies that are going to be made about this what is that portraying uh -huh. right um and even now i don't know if you guys saw in the daily show trevor noah had this clip of um basically calling out media for their blatant racism right and so i'm just curious about movies expanding that narrative uh -huh. right mm -hmm. especially in what i think a vulnerable society like the us because we don't encourage critical thinking in our schools so yeah. look at texas and florida um and i'm sorry if any of you are in texas and florida right now <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that's what I've been, I was I was thinking, right? Like, what can they can be used for? Like, I think it, that Pan's Labyrinth does that. Like, he shows another side of what happened in Spain, mm -hmm. and and uh, and then, but also like what other movies have done that to to point out this is the villain, this is who you need to watch out for, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, the war movie as a genre, um, you know, from the American perspective, is deliberately made to propagate uh, mm -hmm. the ideology of capitalism, white supremacy, <laughs> white supremacy, capitalistic, you know, patriarchal, yeah. put them all together, and then you've got the genre, right? Mm -hmm. um, War profiteers uh, are never, uh, you know, part of the picture, except in like a movie here and there. Mm -hmm. War Dogs, a recent film about, you know, these guys that they want to make uh, profits out of the film, but it's about individuals, not about the big corporations that are. I recently gave a, a presentation on on this, um, who's profiting from war and why it's big business. Right? Uh, we're talking, uh, you know, in billions and trillions of, of profits that uh, are made from wars. And this business in Ukraine, uh, you're right, Carolina, they're gonna make movies. So Zelensky will be the hero and then, you know, somebody will play him, some new actor, you know, Hollywood actor and so forth. And, um, the, the sad thing is that the, in reality, um, you've got the West with their, you know, double standards. Right, um, having the machinery to produce the kind of narratives that can easily fool people into buying into the narrative of, well, here's the David and Goliath story happening right in front of your eyes, right? Uh, and, you know, so you get the one-sided analysis and one-sided stories and atrocities are just, you know, brought to your uh, screen. Whereas, you know, things like this have been happening, the Westerners being having a direct hand in it, and they also have a direct hand in the Ukraine situation as well. Um, they keep, you know, weaponizing civilians for what? Right? It's the question that none of the analysts on, on any of the mainstream media, you know, channels are asking. Why, why are we, uh, EU and, and the US, um, and the Canadians and the Australians, why are we weaponizing the civilians to go to their deaths? And then we're glorifying this. So, you know, they're standing up to a tyrant. And um, 
we didn't get these stories when the invasion of Iraq happened and the invasion of Afghanistan happened. We don't get these stories about what happened in Yemen with the proxy war between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. And, uh, you know, who were the Saudis getting their, uh, their, their weapons and, and serious machinery of, of the killing machinery that they have and, and how many children were killed and uh, the country is absolutely destroyed. Um, and uh, culpability is not part of the discourse, right? So, and the war genre, uh, war movie genre was, continues to be uh, a, a profit making genre that it's not about the profit, the capital that is produced uh, with money, it's about the social capital that the war movie genre produces because that's how ideology operates. Ideology is never direct, it's always indirect. And in most cases, it comes through a culture industry, a culture industry that produces certain kind of books and certain kind of movies, television programs. And now, of course, you know, we have with the new media and the increasing speed of uh, spreading messages uh, with social media is a big part of this. Uh, any aggregating platform, whether it's social media or some other you know, source, uh, it's working towards a specific ideology and people will buy into it. There is another element here that once in a while, you know, we see movies about it, uh, but to what extent we, we see those movies uh, uh, is, is the question. The long history of uh, the world, essentially, with old countries like India, like uh, Russia, like China, uh, like Iran being part of the, the remnants of, of the Persian Empire. Um, and the Europeans, you know, all have their own, uh, you know, old country. Um, what uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Vijay Prashad, uh, said, the chauvinism. Of, of these countries, you know, how they, it comes up, the nationalism, ultra-nationalism that we are kind of gets propagated regularly, news channels about the Ukrainians and, and you know, and people are up in arms about it and all that. And then ultra-nationalism that is happening on, on, in Russia with their own propaganda saying, well, this, you know, we're, this is mother Russia and then Ukraine ought to be part of, you know, Russia and so on. Um, so, that history and, and history, of course, always, you know, is a series of narratives as a result of people using facts to produce their, you know, I, it, ultimately, it all boils down to power dynamics. Those with the biggest computers will produce the, the massive amount of messages. Those with the, the, the resources will get the kind of filmmakers and, and actors and, and uh, executive producers to, to come together and produce brilliant, technically speaking, brilliant films that are glossy and then they, they tug at your emotions. If you read my piece about the cinematic encounter, that's what I'm talking about. The, uh, how we, we can, there is no escaping it, right? The suspension of disbelief and then projection and identification. If you can identify with the characters and the themes, then you're in it, right? And, and to, to think that you're not affected by it and you can separate yourself from it. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen that happening with anybody, right? We're all affected by this because that's the, the mystique of, of cinema. Um, so then it, it, the question we ought to ask as scholars is what about the ethics of such cinema? What's the, what's the end result? What is the end game here? What are we doing, right? 7.9 billion people on the planet, majority of whom become pawns of uh, a game played by the elite of different countries. Now the elite are transnational. They're not nationalistic. The elite, the billionaire class is not, you know, they can, they cannot relate to their fellow countrymen and women. They relate to other billionaires, other countries, right? And they can travel anywhere they want at any point. They have the ultimate freedom and they're the owners of societies, 
right? And then so to buy into the narrative that, oh, this is all about, you know, standing up to uh, a tyrant and all that, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a folly. Um, but atrocities will occur, and it's occurring right now, and, and, and uh, people will get dispossessed, uh, uprooted, and, and this will have uh, effects, reverberating effects for generations to come. And that's, in, in some ways, you could say that's the history of humanity. Yeah. Anyways, uh, sounds like I'm preaching now. Yeah. Uh, don't look up. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I saw it. it. Did you guys see Don't Look Up? Yeah. What did you think? Too close to reality. I'm like, this is where we're living in. Pretty grim at the end. Yeah. <laughs> the apocalypse is here. They mm -hmm. did a really good job of keeping you entertained. First of all, there was big names throughout mm -hmm. the entire film, uh -huh. which would attract somebody to watch it yeah. in the first place because you see these names that you love them in all these other films. And so you see, oh, they're in this film, so I'm going to watch it. So I think it was really smart the way they did it and they didn't do it with you know speaking about whatever topic it is whether it was really if they were talking about climate change or I, I feel like you could intertwine a lot of different things depending on the person interpreting what it was but they did a really good job of of not saying what their real meaning was behind it but you got it you got like you uh -huh. you, you could grasp it and you could laugh at the same time um, but it was one of those films that I still think about. I mean, it's been a couple of weeks since I've seen it. I still think about it every once in a while. So it had an impact on me. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way in which they they portray the female version of Donald Trump, it was, I think it was a brilliant move. And they picked the right actress for that. <laughs> and then DiCaprio playing against the types that he, we normally are used to seeing you know he plays a scientist when was the last time he played a scientist he was also in a film that uh, sometimes goes unnoticed uh, under the radar screen um, where he plays uh, a war profiteer what's it called the uh, darn it not the diamonds black diamonds yeah, about the diamonds yeah Blood about diamond. diamond right yeah right Yes, um, I do recommend seeing that. And mm -hmm. it kind of speaks to, uh, I guess, uh, DiCaprio's uh, approach to the ethics of cinema, right? He's increasingly, uh, now that he has the star power and the freedom, I guess this is the thing about freedom, right? Only a certain kind of people have freedom in, in any society, um, our so-called democratic society, who, who are the, the real free people? professional athletes, professors, um, some doctors at a high level, uh, uh, celebrities, right? The uh, musicians and the filmmakers, of, you know, actors, the, the stars. Um, everybody else is kind of like tied into the system that just keeps you know, tugging at you. Uh, so I, th I think he and him and, 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 and a few other actors are um, assuming the moral responsibility. And this also applies to athletes and, and particularly in the National Basketball Association that uh, they've recognized the, the historical moment that they have freedom and they have power and they can influence people, uh, right? So, so they pick projects that are ethically in the place of you know, working towards social justice. Now, how that plays out is a different question. Does it succeed? In, in promoting social justice, or does it just end up being an uh, entertaining film for liberals who that conservatives can make fun of or, or you know, fight against? Uh, it remains to, uh, to be seen in the history books. If we survive, then I think that's a good point, though, because I know people who are on the conservative side that. I don't even think, I, I haven't asked them directly, but I've mentioned the movie to them and they're like, oh, it's that one about, and they're like, yeah, I guess I'd, it, so they weren't even interested because they could already tell it was gonna be something that 
provided some cognitive dissonance <laughs> for uh, that. Yeah, exactly. And so and, and I don't, that, so that's a very good point. It might have just been entertainment for those of us who already feel a certain way or, yeah. you know, um, but hopefully, you know, that's just a small little portion of who I've encountered. Hopefully there's somebody else who watched it and it kind of made them just think a little bit, even if it didn't like change their whole perspective, but maybe it changed like something, just something small. Yeah, I mean, the intention of the film is to really scare the shit out of you, right? And so make you act. It's like, you know, it's like the, the people in the climate crisis uh, activism for so long, they're just banging on the doors, like, wake up, you know, uh, open this door, come out and take a look, you know. Um, let me pause for a second, you guys. Carolina and, and Molly uh, joined us later. So we'll, we'll catch up with them. So we went around the room at the beginning and, and sort of checked in. So Carolina, what's happening with you? How's life or her things? Um, yeah, so we're near the end of the of winter quarter. So it's that kind of week with finals and paperwork and stuff. Uh, so I have a break coming up, which I'm excited because then I get to write for you and my other class. <laughs> um, and yeah, just kind of um, getting through the semester and the quarter, but things are well, considering the state of the world. Right, right. Well, yeah. 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 And, Tori, I think you and I were in the same conference a couple of weeks ago because you mentioned it in one of your the Northwest Regional Equity Conference. It was really good. Oh, um, it was so good. Yeah. Very cool. And you know, yeah. in July, you are coming to the residency in July, yes? You guys are coming to the residency because I'm in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Now, the, the plan is for me to be there as well. So we'll see. Cool. Yeah. You know, things can change, but. Uh, yeah, I know. It's a good chance that I'll be there. Uh, Molly, thank you, uh, Carolina. Molly, uh, how are you? How are things? What's happening? Uh, hi, I'm happy to be here and uh, touch in. I've been um, just resting a lot, honestly, after just feeling like many, many years of um, working very, very hard. So, um, and I'm, I'm working on a, a, car, a deck of cards for mindfulness for new moms. And uh, I would love a vote. Who likes purple and who likes green better? <laughs> Could we put it in the chat? I like purple. Did you say the other one's green? Yeah, it looks really light. It looks like white. Actually. It's Robin said blue. Yeah, I prefer the purple too. Yeah, yeah I vote purple as well. Yeah. The purple stands out to me, but it mm -hmm. might be different if I was seeing it in person. I don't know. I think purple is uh, the heavyweight of this. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you. <laughs> thanks for checking in. Thanks. Um, let's let's return to our discourse about cinema. Uh, so aside from the thin red line, what else do you want to talk about? We could talk about any of them. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, uh, at least to uh, we'd be remiss not to bring up uh, uh, the filmmaker Bong John Hu mm -hmm. and his two films. Uh, both uh, affected me quite a bit. One mm -hmm. was the parasite, the parasite. Right, right. And the other one was Okja. Okja was uh, phenomenal, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, what Jessica was talking about, you know, our cognitive dissonance, uh -huh. the environment, you know, we um, feel deeply, but then we go back to the very same ways that are hurting the environment. Uh -huh. And that is so brilliantly shown without the gore. Uh -huh. uh, because I think uh, all of us who are in cities are completely disconnected from the process of how you know, our products and food, including food mainly, mm -hmm. come to us and how disposal happens. And this film, I think, really brought in, you know, that without exposing um, uh, things that cause people pain and outrage, but still caused it. So I think his Okja was even, even stronger than Parasite. For me, um, 
I think the more we talk about just humans and our emotions and feelings and war, I think there's a great amount of speciesism because we still are separating ourselves from the rest of the earth and land and billions of other creatures. And that is something that will continue to carry on and probably destroy our race if we don't consistently bring in the environment and how whatever we are doing hurts the land uh -huh. and waters and soil and air and everything else, things that are basic for our survival. And I think both his films touched upon these subjects, um, maybe not in a humorous way, but they leave a lingering uh, impact on you. Uh -huh. I don't know what I have, have every, has everyone seen the two movies I'm talking about? Parasites, the one yeah. with Oscar, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you type, uh, Priya, would you mind typing the two titles in the chat? Oh yeah, okay. Parasite is a, is a serious commentary, if you like, uh, about neoliberalism and its impact um, in South Korea, uh, what it's done to people. It's a brilliant film. There's some like very disturbing <laughs> towards the end, right? Uh, you see it as a comedy that, that moves along and it's a serious comedy. So it's not just, you know, it's not dumb and dumber kind of comedy. Yeah. It's a uh, Shakespearean comedy. Uh, right. So yeah, I, I haven't seen the other one, uh, but now that you mention it, I think it's on my list now. Uh, yeah, it's actually an, an animated film. But so is this the one that I just put the, the advert, the, um, is this the one that you mean? It's it's like a girl, and then yes. is it like a big is it a big, a big animal big. kind of thing? I don't, I don't know. We needed on. a miracle. Uh, a mistake. I turned that on. Sorry. Yeah. I and just, then we got one. Yes. That's it, the one, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. It's a, oops. How do I turn this? On? <laughs> <laughs> it's a modified, genetically modified animal, and so right. it's in science as well to show our intellectual you know, uh, imagination, how far it can go and what it does to the animal, to the girl, to the environment and how that animal has its own you know, future with its children and what happens there. So it is a powerful film of our prowess as well as the future. It gives you a lot to think about. And it's done really beautifully. So it doesn't cause you pain, you know, watching any slaughter, but it, you are left with the sounds of squealing and it's painful because there's a ripping apart of the human and the animal. So it's very effectively done. And I do, today, first time I learned about uh, the, the techniques you were talking about. Now I will look at films with a more critical, you know, eye. So I'm grateful for that. But both these films, I think, are absolutely worth watching. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I've been doing a lot of reading about speciesism um, because, you know, my a lot of my focus is um, in trying to figure out exactly what I want to do. Oh, as my dog <laughs> stretches in the background. Um, he said, oh, you're talking about me. Um, and, and uh, you know, humans, a lot of times speciesism, we look at it as in the view of humans are above you know any non-human animals but i one of the, the videos that we watched the isle flowers it actually demonstrated a, a reverse situation where the pigs were put above the humans and they made a statement that it just stood out to me was that the, the, that's done because the humans don't have money or an owner and i just it was like the first time i think that i would ever seen a demonstration of speciesism in reverse of what I normally see with humans. Um, so it was just a, it's interesting because you were, that brought something to light in the, in that film, the Isle of Flowers. Now I want to see these other two to see. Yeah. Cause I've been doing a lot of reading about that. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for mentioning the Isle of Flowers. I haven't seen that either. Oh, oh that was, the, so I apologize. You said this week was, um, you were a, a bit behind. So the, <laughs> the, the, it's, a, it's a shorter video. Um, it's one of the, the, the shorter videos in our reading and resources. 
It was maybe 20 minutes long or something? Uh, it's, okay. Yeah, less than that. Less it, than that. Was, I can't even remember. <laughs> now, Isle of Flowers, uh, my own story about it is the first time I saw it was at film school. And it was a transformative film for me. This is Jorge Furtado's brilliant film, uh, you know, about what goes on in Brazil. Uh, and his uh, is a low budget film, <laughs> very low budget, but you don't need a lot of money uh, when you have talent and then you have the right ethics in place to tell a, a story and then show it, show the narrative uh, in a creative way that it makes you laugh, all right, because of its brilliance in, in this comedy. Then at the end, it gets you. This is what this is about, right? Parasite uses the same logic, right, for uh, for its narrative. I haven't seen the other, the animated film, but um, so if you don't get to see any of the other films that I've got for you know listed for the, this week and next, make sure you see the Isle of Flowers, all right? And uh, I'm really curious to see, you know, what you think about that because, you know, it was made a long time ago, but it's still to this day relevant. And these films will always be relevant because it's about, you know, again, the power dynamics and how the powerful forces um, use humanity uh, and, and abuse humanity and then they destroy the ecosystem as a result, uh, right, along the way. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I came across a quote uh, and it really stood out to me. It was by Goethe. It's about how we use our reasoning to explain everything unreasonable. And it, that was powerful. It, you know, anything we can reason uh, if, uh, if we want to go ahead. Mm -hmm. And another uh, side, another quote, it was, I think, by Marx where he talks about the ideas of the ruling class are the main, they will always be the main discourse. Mm -hmm. And it'll, they'll draw everybody else into it. Uh, and people won't even know it. It's, it's how, you know, like you, you said, patriarchy, all of these things, capitalism, it's such a part of us that we don't even know when we discourse, we are actually speaking from those platforms. Uh, even if we are good, we have good intentions. So I'll find the two quotes, but they, now that we're talking about films, I have to go back, find them, and maybe share with the class so the class can keep both these in mind as they watch the films. Because both are, are significant to our thinking and our way of being and acting. Yeah. And there was something in the bell hooks reading. I couldn't, that's a big one you gave us to read. Uh, I just happened to glance through one chapter. That chapter was powerful where she talks about philosophies first that come into the mind and how they slowly are by the media and you know groups like that, they become ideologies like you explained. Mm -hmm. And when we buy into that ideology, then there's no separation from it. And then all our social engagement happens within that ideology. Mm -hmm. So if your ideology is on the wrong side of history, you end up just thinking you're a good person, but going on with things that will ultimately hurt the future generations. And I think our current ideology is so narrow. It, it may seem like we are very intellectual, but it's so narrow where we don't think of the past that knowledge was built from our ancestors. And we don't think about the safety and care of maybe our children's children. So uh, I was thinking again, uh, I, I constantly think about how animals you know, are thinking. And I was thinking the only way to care for something is caring for your offspring. And many of us are mothers here. We understand how much that that means to us, it's our purpose in life. But I think with animals, caring for their offspring is about caring for the land. And that became very real for me, that unless you take care of land, you can't take care of your offsprings, offsprings, offsprings. 
And we don't have that thinking because our ideologies are set and we are constantly discussing this war and the current situation, which is why we also forget trauma of you know slavery for from 400 years and the trauma that the Yemenis are undergoing. So I think when you, the, my piece in the education is really trying to look at animals and other beings. You know, we say we are intellectual, but we can't swim in water, underwater and breathe. We can't fly. So there's, there must be a better brain there that is not expressing because we have not learned that language. I think uh, we have to look more into our environment with everything we do um, and try to protect that as we educate or as, as we learn to educate ourselves and others. Um, yeah, I think it's integral uh, for, for us who have the intentions of, of getting to a place where we can contribute to uh, humanity becoming better uh, as a whole, to remember that we're not the masters of the universe. This is the hubris of the human condition. Right? Human beings thinking that, you know, I can master anything and I'm in charge of the universe. The little mosquito, I was watching a, a PBS news uh, piece yesterday about how mosquitoes can transmit diseases and, and how, you know, in Florida, scientists are working, uh, producing the kind of eggs that, that could, mosquitoes, killing mosquitoes so we don't get all these deadly diseases spread around and all that. Um, that little mosquito can be much more powerful than any human being, all right? The invisible uh, virus known as coronavirus COVID-19, mm -hmm. what it's done to to humanity at large. So we have to find the humility and recognizing that if we if we have the intentions of getting to that place where we can contribute, uh, find the humility to, to, to see that we are just another member of the ecosystem, not its master, not its most powerful, not its, the smartest, none of that stuff. All right. I use this thought experiment with, uh, with sometimes I use a thought experiment that, you know, what if, what if there are some species in another planet, somewhere in the universe or another universe, you know, and uh, they have the ability to, to see us and examine who we are and what we're doing here on this planet called Earth. Um, and they're far more advanced than, than we are. We've ach they've achieved a certain level of consciousness that we, we, we haven't even scratched the surface of. Um, what if that's the case? And also think about what we do with, you know, when you see uh, yeah. insects and, and things that are just, you know, invading your environment and, and then you want to step on them or you don't care about their welfare and you're like, they're ir irrelevant to my life. Those aliens in that planet, they look at us and why would they want to come and make contact? Why would they want to be, <laughs> to learn about us? Right? Why would they care? We're like those little insects to them. The thought experiment is so we can gain perspective on uh, who we are and where we stand uh, in the grand scheme of things. Now, solipsism is uh, the theory of philosophical theory about how the world is only exists within our mind. What we see is reality, and all that. everything is in our mind, and we get trapped in it. So, if we subscribe to solipsism, then we're in big trouble. Big, big trouble in terms of consciousness, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, being in, in, in a fair place on, on, on the planet. And we're, we're doomed to fail. We're bound to be manipulated by uh, more powerful forces. So we can exit the bubble of solipsism and uh, see things uh, the way they can be. Then we got something, I think. It would take us, I mean, who knows? Right? 
Do I have that that uh, mm. crystal ball to, to tell you I don't? Does anybody? Yeah. Now, it was a question that Lindsay brought up in the chat, and I think it's uh, it merits attention. And uh, uh, I wonder if we should talk about it a little bit. Is in history cyclic? You mean cyclical? Cyclical, yeah. Is Sorry, it? my bad spelling. <laughs> okay. Can you expand and, and frame the question with more of an expansion? What do you mean by cyclical? Well, I was just thinking about repeating itself, really, um, in that. Uh, I, I mean, after I after I wrote it, you know, I'm thinking evolution and everything, of course, is always changing and we're moving forward constantly. But that kind of um, circle of life, like Piers explaining, you know, we're all part of the earth and we're, you know, living, breathing and, and uh uh, living, dying, like all those cycles that are that are happening, and you know, like we're we're talking about this uh, uh, war right now and pandemics, and these are not new. Like this has been going on for for generations and generations, right? It's not. Um, there's always always these constant things. So I was I was thinking about about that as a as a cycle and, and we're as a race if we're thinking about the 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 timeline that we are actually getting to revisit things and re-examine things and be able to do things better so maybe this will be the war to end all wars because we're going to be able to as a as a uh, universe as a, a world will be able to understand that maybe violence is not the way forward anymore and we're not going to supply guns we're not going to build guns anymore is that a possibility that's going to happen in the future after this big discussion or um i don't know that that we're no longer going to talk about pandemics in the same manner because uh there'll be constant cures or whether uh we're not going to spread the information as quickly i i i don't know like but that we can revisit things and and do better as a as a race a whole race what are your thoughts um i don't want to dominate the discussion by just offering micro lecture after micro lecture <laughs> but it, the Actually, speaking of history, um, recently I had a conversation that was actually video recorded for um, the center that I'm a fellow at. Uh, and I'll, I'll share that video with you guys, it's on YouTube, um, with a friend of mine who is uh, a world-renowned historian, uh, his name is uh, Mustafa Dada. We talked about this very specific thing, is history cyclical? And, and he has an answer. And the answer is, his answer is no circumstances, the epochs of, of uh, the history of humanity, you know, all these different factors are involved and things happen differently, uh, etc. So it's, I think it's a good discussion. It's about an hour. You could take a look and just fast forward and etc. But um, I'll share that video with you guys. Um, so what do you want to say about what, you know, Lindsay had to say about this? Reflections. Mm -hmm. I'm actually feeling that your friend is right. It's not cyclical. And the reason, again, is because of my thinking about our other relatives, plants and animals, throughout the Homo sapiens, the, from the time our ancestors moved out of Africa, I don't really think we have thought deeply about our connection with the earth. We have seen our smarts and we have developed on that and i think that has brought us to this point and we are today seeing this war and you know uh, the fact that we can one per group can use nuclear power the other chemical weapons so we've come that far but i think what's left out of the discourse is this whole connection that we are part of an ecosystem something dawned on me as i was doing my writing this week that how do we even get people to make this connection between us and the ecosystem? And then I 
thought about our own gut. It is a microbiome. We are literally 99% not human. We are, we are really bacteria and virus and everything else. And there is human, and, which is the gross body. But all of it is, there's a lot of bacteria. So I was thinking the best way to think about it is actually look at our own bodies. And this came to me during meditation uh, that, you know, it is, um, it's our own bodies reflect an ecosystem that is reflected outside and that is reflected in the universe, the cosmos. So we have to think of it that, you know, we are never going to flourish without our gut flourishing. That means we can't flourish without our outer bodies flourishing with the ecosystem outside of us. And similarly, Earth has, if Earth has to survive, we have to also figure out, you know, we can't mess up <laughs> with Elon Musk satellites all over the, <laughs> messing up our skies, making decisions by one man for the rest of the Earth. <laughs> right. one, one very arrogant man. <laughs> Again, the hubris of, of humanity. Um, yeah, when it comes to history, uh, you know, Priya, you make it a very good point, of, uh, the interconnection with, with everything. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with, with Hegel and, and his philosophy. Um, you know, he offered the German idealism idealism as, as his way of uh, looking at the world. Um, there's this famous notion that he presents in his arguments that history, it, there's a wheel of history that just turns and we have no control, connection, no um, involvement in terms of changing its course. But we are part of it, right? And it, it can crush us. We can be crushed under the wheel of, of history turning. Uh, but then there's an argument against that, against Hegel, saying, no, uh, we are the actors, along with all the other things that are involved in the ecosystem, uh, that uh, make history. And uh, our actions can directly change the course of history. Uh, and, uh, and then that action is also interconnected what happens with our environment, whether it's from above or down below. Um, and the extent to which we participate in history is determined by history. So um, I hope that makes sense, right? Um, so in some ways, the circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in determine what direction our history can take. But then the level of awareness is one thing, and then what actions we take based on that awareness is another. Lots of people are aware of what goes on. And then what Jessica was saying, uh, you mentioned cognitive dissonance when it sets in. There, there are different ways of uh, responding to cognitive dissonance. Sometimes we just reject it. No, no, no. I, I prefer to be in my uh, little world uh, and suspend all of that stuff and, and just accept this narrative as my reality. And, and I don't want to uh, accept anything different. So I'll look for confirmation biases everywhere. And that's easy to find, given the, the, you know, the way that technological world works. Another response to cognitive dissonance is, right? <laughs> like, okay, I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to deconstruct myself. I'm willing to, to see if I can get out of the, the abyss and come out a better person from the other side, because I've seen the facts of life pressing against the ideas that I thought were just the way things are, right? Um, and then there is another approach to cognitive dissonance that many people take. It's like, well, I'm gonna pick my battles. This one, I will reject. 
Another one, when I reach it, you know, I will accept and change my ways. Can we be selective is the ultimate question when it comes to, to this. Can we be selective when it comes to history? And then uh, what side of history are we on? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, we have power, but how much power we have in, in relation to the other powers? Can we stop the sales of weapons to Ukraine? Can we stop Putin and his army from advancing further into Ukraine? People are not asking those questions. They're willing to go and, and buy into a narrative one way or the other, right? The good guy versus bad guy. One guy is a good guy and the other guy is a bad guy, you know? Um, it's a difficult thing to deal with. Now, one of the vehicles that they can help us kind of deal with this uh, is actually movies. Cinema can do this. Cinema of substance can, can really help us think about these things and uh, engage with ambiguity. Right? It's one of the most difficult things, with, with uh, particularly in the Western world, because the scientific mindset is always in place. Uh, we want everything to be clarified, explained neatly and and if it's just too ambiguous, we're like, okay, I'm going to reject that ambiguity. I'm going to go look for something that gives me clarity about all of this. All right. And there are lots and lots of forces, ideological forces, that are willingly giving you the boilerplate answers or even long, uh, you know, as we were saying, <laughs> using reasoning to explain the unreasonable in a way that you go, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. No, I know all about it, right? I'm done, right? I figured it out, right? Now I can cry, or I can be happy, or I can do nothing, or I can do something, I can give money, you know, whatever. Uh, so cinema can, can be a, a huge, you know, uh, assistant here, uh, massively uh, change minds and, and, and so on, provided uh, you get access to it and then you're willing to go there. You're willing to engage with ambiguity. You're willing to engage with the opaqueness of the human condition. There's something I'm thinking about, you know, how the impact of cinema, cinema, especially when things like what's happening these days, right? But it doesn't. It doesn't look like those those movies get done at the time where we need to respond a certain way. <laughs> they get made years after they're like oh yeah like i think of vietnam right and then in the 80s there were all these movies made about vietnam that some of them were pure propaganda but others were criticism you're like okay great <laughs> but it's been 20 years and there was a lot of damage done right and then you go to the 90s and the 2000s and um you know everything that happened in iraq and every like you know and those movies are not, I think we're still too close to it <laughs> to be made to, for people to say, yes, I want to watch that and look at it from a critical perspective, right? And so, and, and so it kind of brings me back to Lindsay's question of, is it cyclical or is it that we learned 20 years later and by we mean as a society, right? Because there are groups of people that are looking at it from a critical point of view but in terms of as a collective mm -hmm. that transformation takes a long time right like the way we talk about things that happen in the 60s but how long did it take right and now we're starting to talk about what happened in the 80s <laughs> you know so so how do we describe that? Is that linear? Is that what it, yeah, I don't rather know. than be cyclical? It's a right. spiral, right? Like <laughs> I, mean, I see it as an evolution in a way, but a really backwards because it almost feels also like we're programmed to view the world a certain way in these binaries, and that the only way to respond is by firing missiles places. But like, can we imagine something different? 
but I feel like we're constantly in this loop of ideas, right? Um, but then it, it advances with time. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the responses to what was a response during the civil rights movement are obviously, obviously not gonna happen now, but there are different ways of responding to like, so it's just, I don't, I don't know if, it, if it's, 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 a, it's a loop of evolution and I don't know how much of an evolution that is, you know, because we're still as like a society being programmed to think a certain way, unless we're willing to resist that programming, which comes with a price. Yeah. So. And whether we're, but this is the thing where Priya was talking about that we're, we're not going back to the ecosystem and, and mm -hmm. I kind of feel we, we will. We're just not there yet. It's the, the we've got to we've got to resist so many other things that are happening, and yeah. we we've got to process all of those things. But I think we will. And and you know, in terms of you talking about us being organisms and things, and 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 tiny invisible things like Corona, with with more discussions of those things, mm -hmm. it, it is going to get us there because. Mm -hmm everything's interconnected and I think we are yeah. beginning to make those connections but we're not there yet <laughs> and who, who's the we I think that's another important part of it you know Kira, Carolina you were talking about something I was trying to write it down at some point you were talking about a we but I don't know if our culture is really set right. up to encourage a we or to encourage the idea that we can take action I mean, Dr. Kashani said something about, can we stop the sale of weapons and you, I'm like, I can't <laughs> barely get up at 6.30 every morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's happening, but, but if that's the message the world is giving you, right? Wake right. up, put your clothes on, go to work, right. do yeah. your thing. Um, and that's the message that we send, I think, students. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, we present what it is to be educated, both in terms of the content and the experience. And so I think that has to somehow be a part of it. And I'd like to be optimistic and think, well, one of the gifts of being human is that you can adapt, which means you could probably learn to see the world in a different way, right? And maybe the aliens would be interested in us because <laughs> humans, you know, as much as we can cause destruction, we can also create and make beautiful, amazing things and come together, right? Like there is a good part, mm -hmm. um, but I'm hung up on the we, like how do you, and even we were talking about the ethics of movies. Well, okay. So I went and watched a movie by myself and I watched it and I talked about it with my husband, but I don't know if that's, is that it? But, so I don't know. Those are the things that I'm thinking about. But what about talking about it with students in a classroom or an auditorium? Right? Yeah. Are there large gatherings? Well, I had that. So, so my answer to your question earlier in my mind, when you were asked, can cinema be transformational? Is um, we read, I really like this play, Raisin in the Sun. So mm -hmm. we talk about it a lot. We connect it to housing and history. And, mm -hmm. and the students are very drawn to the character of Benita, like, because she's probably the closest to where they are in their lives, even though she's in college. And I showed recently, the last time I did this, I showed the movie with Sydney Poitier. Poitier? Yeah. Sydney Poitier. Correct? Poitier. Thank you. And they looked at the book in a completely, in a, a really different way. Uh -huh. They thought the movie was, and you know, one of my students, he said, I really liked the movie. It, it was way more, you know, um, engaging. And I think he became more engaged with the story by watching the actors on the screen bring it to life. It became more real because it seems distant, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Even if it was in black and white, but the story of it seems distant. And when we were talking about housing inequity in Durham, you know, how the three, the, the, the freeway was built in the middle of the African-American community. And, you know, the same thing that's happening in a raise in the sun, basically. Like that happened here in Durham, where? And so then we got on the bus and we drove there to this area that has some houses, but it's just basically a cleared field. 
right? Clear, empty field that Durham has been promising to build houses on since, I don't know, the 50s or something, but was historically this really thriving African-American community. I mean, Durham's called the other Black Wall Street in addition to the Tulsa one. So I think in that way, the film was transformational because it brought something that seemed distant, uh, maybe closer and it seemed more real. I don't know if I'm describing this accurately, like more immediate maybe even than reading the book in increments and then having discussions. Um, so maybe in a way that was transformational. Sure it was for some. And that's, isn't that the end goal? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Very important. And you did describe it brilliantly. So, you know, I think. Well, you know, we are reaching the, the two hour mark. Um, how are you guys feeling? Are we uh, anything? You don't want to leave things, you know, unset, Any stones unturned, <laughs> as it were. Um, any questions or anything? We'll have another session before the end of the term. Um, Sorry, can I just ask you to the the Russian um, that you that you talked about the Russian director? Um, you mentioned Terence Malik, and the the other one I couldn't quite catch. But is that the one that you speak about in um, the the paper that we read? I've forgotten your title of that paper. Um, You're talking about Tarkovsky? classroom classroom cinema. Tarkovsky. Yes, yes. Andre, can you Andre can you spell Tarkovsky. that for me? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll put Thank it in the you. chat. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tar Andre Tarkovsky, and then the American filmmaker, the Thin Red Line, right? uh, Terence Malick. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, what do you think? I think we're, we're changing the world already. Did we just solve the problems of the world? And <laughs> Priya thinks so, yeah. And, no, I just a thought occurred to me as Angela was uh, speaking. Uh, it's such a beautiful conversation we are having, and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, but it made me think, uh, in order to educate our children, we pride ourselves so much on opinion, you know, our opinion, developing our opinion. And that opinion comes through judgment. We have to make judgments on things and can also lead to certain hubris. So I was thinking instead of judgment or, or opinion, maybe we should just continue to focus our kids on reason. Mm -hmm. Just only reason, no judgment, no, even in this war, no evil, good, bad. There's a history here. There's, you know, bad. We all have bad inside of us. We all have little Putins inside of us. So, um, you know, do we shame somebody? Can we just withhold judgment completely in our education um, and just only focus on reason? I think the spirit of what you're saying is the, the one that can be applied to any pedagogical system. But a child walks into a classroom and says, you know, I think black people are not fully human. How do we respond to that? You say, oh, okay, well, what's your reasoning behind it? And then child give says, them the reason. parents told me so. <laughs> no, you reason. You give them the explanation and keep on asking questions. And that child will be forced to think. Right. Someone had taught me that instead of saying anything like I was struggling with my boss and she said, instead of, you know, saying anything or ac accusing the boss that you've put it on yourself. I'm mm -hmm. feeling this um, and ask questions. How does how what does this mean? What did you actually mean when you said that? So she kind of kind helped me to reason. And that conversation came back that no matter what a child or anybody who, because now we are so po polarized, right? 
And I get quite upset when I see people, you know, still continuing to praise Trump. <laughs> it bothers me. But I was thinking they are coming from a certain background that has allowed them to believe that. Um, and it doesn't mean they are wrong or their ideology is, you know, going to lead them to hell, whatever. Yeah. But I think if we reasoned and asked a lot of questions and we taught our children just that, um, I think they would, uh, we shouldn't give, uh, what I'm trying to say is we shouldn't give so much weight to opinion because it is just human. Mm. But the, the problem of ignorance, could it be wiped away with reason? That's the question. Can reason really be the, uh, the ultimate, you know, alchemist's <laughs> tool? You're going to turn things into gold? because you reason with people. The children might be a lot easier because they're open-minded. Mm -hmm. They haven't been uh, corrupted by ideological means as much as the adults. Mm -hmm. But with adults, then you've got the problem of indoctrination for so many you know, years. And, and then, yeah, again, that the, the little Putin and, and everybody, you know, say, oh, I'm right, and you can't tell me I'm wrong, and I don't care what reasoning you bring, and, and um, it, rational approach is just out the window in that sense. It's a difficult thing, but I think you, the, the right approach is go with reason and then see where it takes you. But sometimes we may have to walk away from ignorance. Because it, does ignorance have limits? <laughs> I think not. It, it's, a, it's a conundrum at times. Mm -hmm. All right. Like, you know, you say, you know, dealing with uh, right now, try to convince anybody that, you know, by anybody, I don't mean like just, just anybody, or just many people that think that Zelensky is a hero. That is the, the, uh, the you know, the man of, of honor and, and all this stuff. Is he? You try to reason about, you know, how he was a pawn of the, the two systems and, and how he's not even a diplomat, you know, and he's, he's and what he's doing, you know, sending young men to, to their death, you know, for, for what purpose? So that the superpowers can play their game. Is that right? Is he doing the right thing? Um, It'd be a difficult argument to win when people are just buying into the narrative of look at this guy, you know, in face of tyranny, he's standing up to, to tyranny and all that, resisting uh, and preaching, you know, nationalism, ultra nationalism, and uh, David and Goliath mythology, very strong, this David and Goliath business. So when mythology wins over facts and, and reality at hand and all that, where does reason stand? <laughs> How strong is reason in, in that realm? Yeah, no, I'm a little idealistic. Thank you for grounding me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I hear you that children, it would be nice if they had this framework of being able to reason with each other no matter how small or big the matter is, because children are very, very intuitive and smart. And that's why critical thinking skills are being brought into education and being, uh, being you know, forced, forced into, into the classroom now, right? The more and more critical thinking skills is a skill that you must have, right? It's the... Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. does the system uh, would like that? Or would the system like that? <laughs> Is it the teachers that are enforcing it? I, I, I don't know. Is it the, the you know, the, the one way of fighting the system is by bringing it in? I don't know. <laughs> you, can, you can be a force of resistance within. Many teachers, you know, have, have discovered that power that they have. And they're like, oh, I can do this. And I'm going to do it. And they are doing it. Um, that's why I love teaching because once I'm, I mean I teach higher ed so it's different 
But once I'm in my classroom, like you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. um, you know, we were talking about a lot of faculty in my college sometimes moving into admin. Mm-hmm. And we're like, don't do it. Don't go to the dark side. Stay here. <laughs> <laughs> because you kind of have to play like you can infiltrate that system but it becomes harder to to do some of that work because you become you, you become part of that but right. then that's yeah. why we have to be so, holistic right don't we have to look at everything as a yeah. whole and, and not yeah and you work line? you work together right like you find the in my case like you find admins who want to do that work to me you just work with them and change those policies and systems that need to that they can change Mm-hmm. right yeah so if somebody crosses to the other side and them, <laughs> you just said yes fear of the monster you fight <laughs> lest you become one <laughs> i know i have several friends who've gone to the dark side i'm like okay you're in the dark side i will take care of you but <laughs> you gotta do your now. part yes yeah as long as they keep it in their heart right yeah. then, then we hope but it's hard it's really it hard good. Just seeing my friends doing that, it's really hard work because man, that system is a monster. Yeah. Higher ed is a monster. It is. Um, the so politics of, of higher ed. <laughs> God. Like they put Putin to shame. <laughs> <laughs> what they do is evil that, that it, it is crazy. But so, but yeah, I think working to get and I think a lot of people are figuring that out you know and faculty especially tenure faculty have a lot of power they do and so we kind of run with that we're like all right on our position of power in the institution we can do this right and then in their position of power they can do other things but it's harder on them because they can be fired at will as an administrator so we know now a lot of tenure faculty can jump into admin and they, for whatever reason they make a move and they get fired, they can go back to being faculty. So that's a little loophole yeah. that we're finding. We're like, yeah. Let's jump in, make those changes and then come back into being faculty. All right, all right, all right. So, that's the way yeah. to do it is it <laughs> let's do that <laughs> i mean you gotta do what you can do because again because and i'm assuming k through 12 is the same it's probably not that it's probably really hard yeah um but having the admin have have some classroom experience whether it's even you know maybe not not taking a class but giving them experience teaching the faculty of what they do you know that maybe they can understand a student perspective more or a teacher <laughs> perspective more you know <laughs> well, you reside in the dark side <laughs> <laughs> you, see it, you know it's like uh sorry uh, if someone is an admin here whoops <laughs> um have you heard this i oh, know you probably haven't right oh, yeah this Professor used to say, you know, what's the difference? Is this joke? What's the difference between a, a Marxist and a liberal? And what the answer was? A liberal is a Marxist with two kids and a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's the, 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 the problem of the liberal, right? Mm. You got a mortgage, you got kids, you got expenses, salary, yep. food, you know, and all that. Yep. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so I think uh, we had a good session uh, and I'll send an email later, um, you know, for the future get together and we'll do another Zoom. But in the meantime, as I look at your uh, submissions of the midterm reports, I'll uh, respond and asking you to Tell me what's good so we get together at the date of time that's suitable and then we'll talk about your papers and then move forward. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Kishani, can I can I ask you a question after everybody leaves?